I grew up in that brief happy window, between school computer labs and school firewalls. My elementary school had 16 computers, Blueberry iMacs donated from Apple during one of their many public school giveaway PR drives. The librarian was so proud of them. I'd take lunches in there and browse, reading facts and early blogs linked from cool sites of the day indexes. Later, I'd play flash games and roleplay in forums, adopt e-pets, make websites. All the trappings of a child let loose on a world still building, a world in which a child could have a hand in building. By the eighth grade, school administrators had installed a firewall on school's computer network, for our safety, of course. There were ways around it. Proxy servers and redirects, VPNs, admin logins swiped from teachers' desks, that sort of thing. But there were not always ways around a teacher coming up behind you to catch you playing flash games on school time. We diversified. We grew clever. We, like every technology-oriented hobbyist before us, found out that the computer itself was a kind of toy, or at least could be used to make toys. Surveilled by the typing instructor in the ten minutes before class let out, we played the kinds of games that weren't games by the looking. Animating stick figures in PowerPoint, playing Battleship in Excel, changing all the UI sounds on Windows ME. Wiki racing. Wiki racing is a simple concept. Players must navigate from one article to another, only using lateral links to do so. You click from idea to idea, concept to concept, attempting to piece a path through the connective tissue, winnowing towards your destination article by finding ever more related concepts. It is a game of dead ends and surprising turns, and, as a child, plenty of guesses in the dark about what a particular word might mean or where a place actually is in this world. Like any game played on schoolyards, there are an infinity of variations to the wiki race. The back button is banned, no sidebars, we start in the same place, we all start somewhere different. No going through UK, no going through United States, winner is the fastest, winner is the least number of clicks, no keyboards, no control F, two players, ten players, the destination is decided each time, the destination is the other player's random article, the destination is selected from the following list. The destination is, and for us it always was, the article on philosophy. We played like this. Two players. An audience, to ensure honesty. A countdown. A click on random article. Here's where fairness broke down, of course. One might have a direct link to philosophy from random article, while another might be one line of text about a bird species in the Arctic. But that was the exciting part, the not knowing where you'd begin. You could click any blue link on the article itself. No back button. No search. No new random article. The clock is ticking. Where have you gotten yourself to? Your friend is trying to help. Look, look, that links to church. Someone else is screaming, no cheating. A piece of food is thrown or a pencil case. The typing instructor is raising an eyebrow. The class bell is about to ring. The bags are being gathered. The chairs are being pushed back. The typing instructor has gotten up to see what the fuss is about. You're sweating a little. It feels like you might have gone in the wrong direction, or perhaps you shouldn't have gotten so lost in taxonomies. And just then, finally, one of you makes it all the way to philosophy, a mega concept that is reliably linked out to eventually, especially the more abstract things get. Most things have some philosophical element once they get big or heady enough, or at the very least, were named after someone who once invented a theory. These are sweet memories in their own way. Children skipping through the mass of human history and turning it into a game of structure and movement, and not one of reading or depth. Connectivity over content, a learning of the shape of the thing and not the texture of it. That's hyperlinks for you. Tim Berners-Lee, eat your heart out. In recent years, I found I wanted to use the wiki racing format for something else again, I envisioned this lecture of interconnected thoughts, the source material on screen, even as I talk over it. The structure apparent, citations shot through implicitly, the web of references spiraling out as I pick a path between them, tracing my own walk, slower now that I am not a child and do not run like I once did, in front of an audience who can verify that I am not cheating. The appeal for me here is the externalized memory system, The collective one, the one that lets me apply my structural knowledge to other people's specific depths. This is reflected in the way I've memorized a dozen surefire paths to philosophy, although my own undergraduate studies on the subject constrain all my year's worth of knowledge to one paragraph of the philosophy article, 
Contents 3.1, on aesthetics. This collective memory system is the great promise of Wikipedia, after all, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Wikipedia owes a lot of its philosophical origins to GNU and the general public license, first written in 1989 and one of the cornerstones of the free software movement. This ideological origin of Wikipedia has perhaps gotten a little bit lost in the interceding years, but Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia, to borrow from GNU, in liberty, not in price. The four freedoms of the GPL are this. Freedom zero, the freedom to use the program for any purpose. Freedom one, the freedom to study how the program works and change it. Freedom two, the freedom to redistribute and make copies. Freedom three, the freedom to improve the program and release your improvements. Though a laudable set of goals on paper, these freedoms are not without their critics. And although I have used free software licenses for specific projects and probably will again, I would count myself among them. Free software comes from a libertarian worldview. Fundamentally, I do not want my work used for any purpose. I have an agenda for the world I want built, and I seek to plant the seeds of that world in my work by any means available. If the tools I make could be turned cross-purpose, I'm not above restricting their use with licensing. This is anathema to free software, and I can't help but wonder if I spent my days writing articles instead of code bases, if I would eventually come to a similar place. I'm not sure. They're different types of tools. But anyone familiar with the free and open source software community would recognize a brand of the internal politicking of Wikipedia within it. Flame and edit wars, vandalism, malicious revision, self-aggrandizement. Every Wikipedia talk page, a listserv in miniature. And of course, a particular type of volunteer, the list well known. Generally white, generally male, generally English speaking. And more than anything else, with enough free time to take weekends to contribute labor to unpaid projects. These with every accordant bias bundled in, even as work is done at an editorial and individual level towards balance. There's also a, to be sure, deeply necessary for projects like Wikipedia, orientation towards truth here, but always a truth that can be held up by apersonal citations, white papers, references. In my own life, I find this kind of truth distasteful. It casts untruth on all that cannot meet its standards, untruth on that which is not citable. This puts the onus of proof on those who have not had their experiences verified by power. Given all this, perhaps it is funny that I should love Wikipedia as much as I do, but I do love Wikipedia in a way that is not purely beholden to the information held within it. I don't visit Wikipedia like I read a book. It is for browsing, for sampling, for picking the sweet berries off of and eating them fresh, right away, still warm from the sun. I wake up after late nights spent diving from article to article and find 45 tabs open in my browser and a folder of screenshots and a fuzzy sort of empty feeling, like I was chasing something, like it was just ahead of me, always out of reach, just a bit down the tunnel, just in the next article. And now, in the morning, all I have is the shape of it, and no, even that has gone. I think it's the passion of the place that gets me, even sublimated through revisions and editing processes, even with the fact-checking, and the established Wikipedian writing voice, and the disclaimers that this section needs verified sources, the care comes through. Somebody loves that seabird, this opera cycle, that particular tomb, and all its attendant atrocities. Someone drives the state route that goes through the mountains every day and is going to write about the view. It is the excitement that catches me, the way that leaks into the barest sentences, the way they demand remembering, and the way it catches in the links, how every piece of blue text is an invitation, a beckoning. It says, oh, you're interested in the Memex, that 1944 hallucination of a computational internet that preceded and influenced so much of the internet we have now albeit one designed on microfiche. Perhaps, then, you'd like to read about the Mundanium, a 20th century data collection attempt to classify the world. Yes, it was called the World Palace. It was to sit inside a world city. The collection once held 12 million index cards. It was a peace project, that kind of European 20th century peace project that believes indexing the world will lead to an ultimate understanding of it, and that an understanding will lead to unity among men as if understanding would follow, like a dog at heel, the capacity to remember. Always, in these total collection efforts, 
It is what is excluded from the archive that tells the broader story. Even in this era of data gathering and surveillance, it is specific motions that are collected. My browsing, my watching, the things I buy, the messages I leave for others in public, but not the eggs I trade to a neighbor, the things I say to my dogs, the curving little catch in my chest when I click through to a notification I'd been wanting to receive. It is the great dream of utopian total recollection archive projects and advertisers both to dully record this too and lord knows they're trying. Every smart home device and wearable comes ready to tell on a blush and to repeat the secrets I say to the oatmeal. But aggregate data is not an archive in the same way that a library is an archive. A dataset reduces to patterns and forgets or privatizes the rest, often throwing away the human inside of it. A card catalog attempts to point to specifics, by which you might imagine the whole, often by throwing away that which does not fit into the current narrative favored by power or dominant culture. They both attempt to extend memory, but in doing so compress it, a reduction from the dense, infinitely detailed moment-to-moment into, here is what was said, here is how it looked, here is who was there, here is the date and the time. Even when or if it catches my pulse, my blush, my blink, there will be more left unrecorded. The only storage medium big enough to hold the world is the world. That blink existed. It was impressed on history, even as it is forgotten, even as it erodes away in the slow action of the turning of time. That the list of films about memory should be so short while the list of films about amnesia should be so long, is a joke of specificity. This is exactly what happens when a subject too broad loses focus in the list. This is because, of course, every film is a film about memory. Every film is a display of dead moments. Frozen, arranged, memorial, cataloged. I recently rewatched Chris Marker's Sunless. In it, he describes a film he'd like to make. It is also named Sun Soleil. It is also a science fiction movie posing as a documentary about a time traveler. He says, I imagine him moving slowly, heavily, about the volcanic soil that sticks to the souls. All of a sudden he stumbles, and the next step it's a year later. He's walking on a small path near the Dutch border along a seabird sanctuary. That's for a start. Now, why this cut in time, this connection of memories, that's just it. He can't understand. He hasn't come from another planet. He comes from our future, 4001, the time when the human brain has reached the era of full employment. Everything works to perfection, all that we allow to slumber, including memory. Logical consequence, total recall, is memory anesthetized. After so many stories of men who had lost their memory, here is a story of one who has lost forgetting, and who through some peculiarity of his nature, instead of drawing pride from the fact and scorning mankind of the past and its shadows, turned to it first with curiosity and then with compassion. In the world he comes from, to call forth a vision, to be moved by a portrait, to tremble at the sound of music, can only be signs of a long and painful prehistory. He wants to understand. I once watched a campus building get torn down over the course of several weeks. I was working at a warehouse near the university and would take my lunch break sandwich and sit across the street to watch the cranes. For some reason, rather than take the building down all at once, they were demolishing it front to back, in layers. It was a four- or five-story building and Warren-like, having served mostly as professorial offices. Every day, by lunchtime, a new tableau had been cheered off, a new network of rooms and hallways visible to the air. Much of the furniture was still in place. I assume anything wanted had been removed and it was cheaper or more labor-effective to simply sort through the rubble for the rest. Once, I saw the huge scoop of an excavator come straight down onto a desk, which tumbled to the earth with the floor that had been beneath it. As it fell, its drawers opened and thousands of papers flew into the sky, swirling like birds before they drifted down to cover the entire build site. Nobody picked them up. Within a half hour, another slice of building came down, burying the paper and concrete and rebar. I later found out it was the old philosophy department. I'm writing this paragraph a few days before I'm scheduled to give this lecture. It is two in the morning. I've just come back inside from the animals. I went out to feed everyone something little just because I knew I wouldn't be up early. The moon was just down, and in the pasture, in the dark, I turned off my flashlight and stood there for a moment in the cold, 
my breath billowing out around me under the crawling winter stars. And it was then that I remembered about the comet. The green comet of now, late winter 2023, was last here 50,000 years ago. It appeared in the sky above a prehistory where human beings still lived next to our sibling species, Neanderthals and Denisova people. In the sky here, it is stuck between Ursa Major and Minor, which means that it hardly moves over the course of the night. Close to Polaris, the stars appear to rotate around it. This was the first time I'd seen it. Fuzzy, faint, but unequivocally there, unmistakable from anything else. A cottony little smudge of a thing, it looks more like the pantry moth cocoons I've been cleaning out of the dry goods all month than some fiery sword. Still, though, an orbit of 50,000 years. That's a hell of a thing. Welcome back, I said with such firm loudness, as if I had to raise my voice a bit for the comet to hear, that the donkey started from his patient chewing beside me and went bouncing off into the dark. In 2020, during the first summer of the pandemic, I became singularly obsessed with the comet Neowise, or to be more accurate, one of the comets Neowise, as they're named for the telescope, not the individual body. I was living back in my hometown. And every night for two and a half weeks, I climbed the biggest hill around, above the new library that wasn't built when I was a kid, and sat watch with my binoculars. There was an older man, always there with the telescope set up. He'd graciously train it to the comet, wipe down the eyepiece with rubbing alcohol, and retreat 15 feet so I could take a look. We'd shout pleasantries at each other over the parking lot. He was the only friend I made that year, and I didn't ever learn his name. My fondness for comets is partly their showy nature, partly a half-remembered childhood viewing of the last time Haley Bob came through in 1997, and a lot their implicit relationship with deep time, with periodic orbits so outside the scale of a human year or even a human life. There's a theory that it was comets that brought the ocean to an early Earth, that it was a billion years of bombardment that aggregated ice into ocean. Few to none of these would be the comets we're still graced by, subsumed, those comets became the terrestrial water. Comets that pass close to the sun are called sun grazers. Small sun grazers vaporize at perihelion. Large ones may escape intact, but always with some of itself lost in the brilliance, like a favorite memory, accessed too often, replaced by the memory of visiting the memory. These are often the brightest comets, the so-called great comets. If I had to name this hour of talking, it would be named this. Sun Grazer. Comets have gripped more than my attention in the fullness of time, and everything from famine to flood to births to plagues have been set upon their appearances. They're even supposed to foretell a good wine year. Comet vintages denote a great harvested under a great comet, and though a distinctly unsightable truth, they do call a little extra attention or price. When I first sat down to start writing this talk a good month ago now, I thought I'd better read up a little on the subjects I thought I'd touch. Memory, monuments, deep time. I'd never seen Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Herzog's 2011 documentary about the cave paintings at Chauvet, despite it being his most popular film. It opens, the very first shot, on a vineyard, planted just outside the cliffs that house the caves of paintings. But the paintings are pre-wine, pre-fermentation. They're also pre-grapes, at least as we know them. Before domestication, they were a much smaller, more tannic berry. If the people who painted the bears and horses at the caves ate grapes, it would have been these wild fruits, acrid and seedy, barely recognizable as the same fruit to a modern palate. I didn't love the movie. It was fine, beautiful even, but affected a flattening of subject. Perhaps I should have tried to see it in 3D as it was shot. Perhaps I would have been happier just reading the Wikipedia article on it. But I loved the opening on grapes. In this way, the people who painted the pictures feel even more recognizable as us. How art making has changed so little in all the time it took to produce the cultivation of grapes. At Chauvet, the dating of the cave paintings is done both by radiocarbon and by observation. Both point to two periods of human habitation some 6,000 years apart, which is, incidentally, about as far from now as the first large-scale production of wine, circa 4,000 BCE. Before, between, and after the periods of painting, 
The cave was home to a now extinct species of cave bear. Their scratches also mark the walls and are incorporated into the work at places, interspecies collaboration over thousands of years. And over it all grows a fine calcite crystal. This too is used to date the markings. Stone in particular environments forms at a specific rate, over millennia. Chauvet has been closed to the public since it was found, a lesson learned on Lascaux and other famous caves. Show caves are all but destroyed by visitation. The microbes that hike in on bodies and that are exhaled from breath make new lives in caverns, colonizing with mold and fungus and even simple carbon dioxide. There is no walking without altering. So, instead, visitors go to replica caves, built above ground in fastidious facsimile of the original. The sound, humidity, and temperature are all controlled to emulate the cave beneath. Lascaux has three of these replicas, with varying degrees of faithfulness to their source material. You could visit all three in one day, and make a date of it. A facsimile is a kind of monument, a memorial to a thing which, even if still extant, cannot be viewed. They are for looking without violence, or rather, for looking with an approved kind of violence, with the knowledge that a facsimile can always be remade and lose nothing. It is hard to predict what will be wanted in the future, which doesn't stop people from trying. The last century has seen the rise of the time capsule, a cultural invention that despite all appearances is for the now, not the later. A time capsule is made so that you may believe some part of you will last, will be remembered, no matter that they are inevitably fairly uninteresting upon their opening full of, to quote, useless junk, albeit pristine and new useless junk. There are even time capsules buried in space. The Pioneer Projects and the Voyager Probes, and someday possibly KEO, a proposed artificial comet that has been set back some 20 years with a timeline that is more launch delays than updates. KEO is made to carry DVDs as well as some terrestrial samples. It will have a 50,000 year periodic orbit, and on re entry, its thermal layer is designed to burn off to create an artificial aurora. Time capsules are fine examples of speculation. They are stories about what humanity is, with every rough edge smoothed over for the sake of looking good for the future. Speaking of narratives, did you know that the Library of Alexandria didn't burn? There was possibly a warehouse fire at some point, which took some scrolls, but all evidence points to a library that simply experienced a slow decline in prestige and cultural importance over a period of centuries, until its collection was divvied out slowly to other institutions and finally lost. Chris Marker wrote about a time traveler who conquered time. He remembers with perfect recall every detail of his life. He wishes to cry unbidden at music, feel his heart quicken and not know the cause. This is why he returns to our time, to witness the love of people who love without understanding why. but my time traveler comes from farther. He recalls not every detail of his life, but of all time. He extrapolates what will come from the perfect detail of the present, and by studying the present, he also knows the past. Like the scientists who trace in the air, unable to touch the painted wall, their touch a corruption, the movement of the cave bear marks, painter, then bear, then painter, then bear again. He can excavate from the present moment, scything both directions in time until it is all one flat panel of inevitability. For my time traveler, there is no need for museums. Every object is an equal archive. Everything present has achieved total density. He walks the earth completely untethered. Transparent, time melts away from him. He has not come to now from the future. He simply sees it all unraveling. He lives as much as anyone like him can be said to live. Floating. This brings another meaning to the phrase, until the end of time. It is monuments that most desire eternity. They operate on a different time scale than us, furious, focused memories carved from materials that resist change. But even monuments live in public. You can see evidence of the visitors to the Greyfriars Bobby Fountain in the shine of his nose, which is rubbed for good luck. The tarnish comes up, and some of the bronze with it, enough so that local officials have attempted to curb the practice for fear of degradation, a rounding made by many hands. 
and many hands over a relatively short time. This photo of the fountain from 2003 to the last 2017 shows a nose still patinaed. Even images in the Wikimedia Commons catch the motions. Greyfriars Bobby was a terrier who lived for two years with a breathing man. He then lived for 14 years above a dead one. What love must have existed in those two years to ask for 14 following of devotion? Or, from another angle, what cruelty must exist in this world to resign a dog to sleep on the grave of a dead man for 5,100 consecutive nights? Greyfriars Bobby is not the only dog to be memorialized in this way. Stories of loyal animals are popular fodder. They become monuments when they are gone. The best of us, they are brave, loyal, smart, went into the unknown, saved a life. When they were violent, it was not their fault. They simply were doing what they were asked to do. Plus, well, everyone loves the statue of a dog. They are the kinds of statues that invite you to rub their noses in passing. Canis familiaris, canine of the household. Dogs were domesticated some 15,000 years ago. Before grapes, but after painting. Probably. The line between a wolf and a dog is a fuzzy one, and some anthropologists claim a species friendship that goes far longer. Regardless, they were the first domesticated species, and this can be seen on a genetic level, with a set of gene-based cognitive changes directly oriented at understanding and communicating with humans. There are a lot of famous dogs, but few stories like Laika. A stray pulled off the street a week before the launch of Sputnik 2. Laika was the first living creature in orbit. Although other spacefaring dogs returned to Earth and resumed normal lives, even giving birth to puppies, one of which was sent to John F. Kennedy, Laika was never intended to return. Before the launch, she was taken home by a mission scientist to play with his children. He wrote, later, Laika was quiet and charming. I wanted to do something nice for her. She had so little time left to live. Official documents from the launch call her by a variety of names, including Little Bug, Little Lemon, and Curly. It wasn't until after that Laika, Barker, was settled on. She has several statues and a plaque, as well as a postage stamp and a brand of cigarettes and, of course, an entire Wikipedia article under her name. Is this propaganda or memorial? It's both, of course. Most things are. I started this year with an expectation of lambs. My sheep are a hardy breed, well adapted to the desert and generally needing little help with anything other than the reliable arrival of hay in their pasture, so I was surprised to find one of my ewes in a hard and early labor in the first week of January. Sheep are born feet first, followed by the head, then the shoulders. The lambs orient themselves in the womb, diving into life like dolphins. I knew something was wrong right away, of course, but I didn't really grasp the severity of it until I saw the limp little head dangling from the body like an apple. I intervened, delivered a dead lamb, buried it in a deep but tiny grave on top of the hill in the pet cemetery that I inherited with the house. I never met the animals buried in the pet cemetery, but I've been going up there for years to pay my respects to Chucho, Red, Angel, and the four other marked but unnamed graves. I think of all the pets I've had to leave buried in the yards of houses I once lived in, a renter who could not take my beloved bones with me, and hope someone else does the same for mine. The lamb joins them. All life makes cemeteries. The headstones are their own kind of monument, even if the pet graves are made of rough carved wood, each already bleaching to brittleness in the sun. Sticking up from the hilltop, they are like a pincushion, each pinning the now to the past. I lived. I ran. I barked. I wonder, sometimes, if it is the tragedy itself that cuts the gap through time, severs the threads of history and stitches the event to the now, present here today or preserved by the jagged edges of its own violence, or if it is instead the marker, which in its solidness attempts to interrupt the flow of time and halt its smoothing work, like a deep pit in the river. Only last week, I found a pair of the unmet Chucho's dog tags unearthed in the sheep pen by the turning of hooves. They are shaped like little bones. They're still in my jacket pocket. I worry them when I'm out in public. They've replaced a small agate pebble that I carried for many years, my fingers turning it into a teardrop shape. I lost it a few months ago, though I'm hoping it might still be in some more esoteric pocket or fallen into the lining of my greatcoat. 
I used to lose it every winter, after all, when I put the coats away in the spring. Given how small the earth and how many the people who have walked on it, it is hard to imagine that there are any sites where a memorial could not be placed, where tragedy has not struck in large or in small. Heather grows pink, but can occasionally bloom white. It is a wild mutation, rises unbidden out of a normal population. But it is said that it will bloom white only where no blood has ever been spilled. Heather is specific, growing in particular regions. Yarrow is almost universal. A friendly plant, it precedes people. No matter where you walk, it often isn't far. White petals, feathery leaves. It has a hundred names and a hundred uses. Stomach upset, toothache, astringent. But its main use is to staunch wounds. For this, it has been called bloodwort, night's milfoil, staunchweed, and woundwort. It was said that the center Chiron taught Achilles to use Yarrow on the battlegrounds of Troy. From this, it took its Latin name, Achillea millifolium, Achilles' thousandth leaf. The first time I ever saw pink Yarrow was on the island of Suomenlina, off the coast of Helsinki. Suomenlina was a sea fortress built as a star fort in the 18th century. It saw a dozen wars, then a prison. There is still a penal labor camp on the island, among the few full-time residents and the picnicking tourists. I was there at midsummer. Longest day, there was sunset but no night. I swam in the ocean at two in the morning and still could not see the stars for the glow at the horizon. By sunrise, I was dry and walking along the enforced battlements looking out to sea. In the cracks of the stone walls grow flowers, and although I didn't know most of them, there was yarrow, of course but it was blooming pink and purple, like the color of wild heather. I picked a flower head and pressed it in my paperback. I later learned that a primary mutagen for yarrow includes gunpowder. History is full of river stones, memories that have been turned in the water so many times that they have become rounded, become soft. The ground remembers the gunpowder, but many of the people are busy forgetting it or telling a story about the memory of gunpowder, the smell of it, the taste, the danger, the role it played in the Great War, but never again that cutting, acrid moment when it bloomed like a flower across the much younger battlements, no moss between the stones, to propel a thing of danger into the night. The horror of that. The jagged violence. Look, I'm doing it now. Rounding a story. There is no explicability until after. That's the job of the editor, maybe, and the impulse that turns the world into encyclopedia entries. I do understand this. It is so hard to catch the specificity of moments. Trying, I fall into unnecessary hyperbole. I know I have this tendency, an overbearing that comes from wanting to make sure that I am understood, that I catch it, that I really show you. But rereading the words, it's always too much, too eager, not the world as it happened at all. In editing, I always find myself winnowing, rounding, until there is little of the original left. Despite my feelings about citational truth, I do much the same. I cannot tell you I felt this way. So I just tell you, I was here. When I write letters, they say things like, There's a fire going in the wood stove. The clouds have settled in over the stars. I'm eating lemon cake. Of course, I'm saying these things with a desperate specificity, as if each does hold the entirety of that moment. Today I ate a pear. I saw a rabbit. I swept the kitchen. I want you to understand that I grew that pear myself, that I watered the sapling I planted last year three times a week, all summer, that when it surprised me with a half dozen pink blush fruits in the fall, I had to look up how to properly harvest them because I'd never grown pears before. How I found in the reading that, unlike many fruits, pears are not best right off the tree. Instead, they sweeten in the cold and the dark of a root cellar, the sugars concentrating and permeating the flesh until it becomes softer, rounder. How I've left them in the back of my refrigerator since September. When I finally cut one open today with my little knife with the cherrywood handle, it was as if a whole season of sunlight spilled out onto my kitchen table. The rabbit, the broom, 
the lemon cake, the wood stove. I want you to understand that each of these moments succeeded in catching me, holding for a second all of my attention and my devotion. Like the pair, each wrapped me up in the solidness of life, suspended me in it, even if just for a second. Still, it isn't enough. There are no words to record this. It is the job of the world and the world only to have that moment of time. The rest is facsimile, memorial, propaganda, story, article. So, I write instead, hoping you'll fill in the gaps. I've put a log on the fire. You can see the moon out my window. I've just shushed my dogs, who were barking. <laughs>